from an agent's perspective, it's really interesting. They think one-dimensionally. They have to get the money that the artist generally wants and the manager generally wants. But beyond that, their prime motivating factor is not getting that call at midnight after the artist has come off the stage of the venue that they've put them in and say, what were you thinking? You know, these people are idiots, this place is a dump. This is not boastful or bombastic. Never, ever, ever. Period, end of story. It just doesn't happen here. Um, and that's partly because of who we are and what we do, but it's partly because of this grand old lady. Well, anything built pre-1918 had to be built entirely with a non-amplified, artificially enhanced amplification of the, the craft, whether you were speaking, dancing, singing, playing. And so great care was taken in acoustic design and research. And the Grand Opera House was built using those same sensibilities and the same technological advancements in architecture that they found. Uh, it should be effective at that time. I mean, it was just made to embrace these performers and their craft and their want to perform that craft. One of the artists that, uh, she was a country artist, and uh, it was Kathy Matea, actually. She talked about, in the middle of the concert, she kind of stopped the concert and walked to the edge of the stage, and she said, you know, when you sing here, this building sings back to you. And they came to the edge of the stage and they did this, uh, unplugged thing for one song. And at the end of it, she said, see, see what I'm talking about? We have three separate ones. And we finally moved from analog to digital, and it, uh, you know, that's a big step. We're probably the last theater on the East Coast to do it. And so now we'll even improve the acoustics more. You know, you see an uptick in the level of performers that we're getting, and although I'd like to take singular credit for that, What's happened is we've just done enough high-profile artists, done well with the show, sold them out, treated the artists well, and in the best-case scenario, if they're on the phone at midnight waking the agent up saying, that place was great, you know, the acoustics were wonderful, working with the people was wonderful. So once you get in that sort of, you know, that mechanism kicks in, it keeps feeding us stuff. I mean, David Byrne walked out on the stage and I thought he was going to fall down when he realized that the audience was right on top of him. They were all standing, they were all cheering. He kind of, you know, was taken aback. But I think it set the tone for that night and the show that he put on. I think once you get that energy going, it feeds back and forth and it, and it just doesn't collide. It, it weaves itself into a really comfortable experience and an environment. Louis Black is funny, uh, the first time he played here, and he's one of those artists that consider coming to the Grand to be coming home for a minute, it's a break on the tour. You know, he knows Othell and the ushers, and you know, they take care of him and they run for him and, and do this and that. But the first night we were standing backstage, his opening act was on and I was talking to him. And the only thing he seemed concerned about was uh, whether or not uh, there was a place after the show to go and, and drink and smoke cigarettes. You know, it's like, you know, where's the best place to do that? I'll be gone someday. Everybody here will be gone someday and the Grand will still be standing. It's not my place and I've never looked at it with any possessive notion whatsoever. I am a caretaker, paid and, and fed by the people of this state and of this community to make sure that the Grand is theirs and their children's and their children's children's to use for many, many years.